So Bhavishya Purana uh, contains descriptions of uh, many, many, many things. Prabhupada used to quote from it often, but it's very mysterious. It has not been uh, translated into English, at least not by anyone who's authorized, uh, anyone who's knowledgeable. Uh, so Bhavishya, what will be? Huh? Bhavishya, Bhavishya. So the next section is serving the deity with great devotion. It is said in the Adi Purana, a person who is constantly engaged in chanting the holy name and who feels transcendental pleasure being engaged in devotional service is certainly awarded the facilities of devotional service and is never given just mukti, liberation. Mukti means liberation from material contamination. When liberated, one does not have to take birth again in the material world. The impersonalists desire to merge into the spiritual existence, to end their individual existence. But according to Srimad Bhagavatam, Mukti is only the beginning of one's becoming situated in his normal condition. The normal condition of every living entity is to be engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. From the statement of the Adi Purana, it appears that a devotee is satisfied simply with being engaged in devotional service. He does not aspire for any liberation from material conditional life. In other words, anyone who is engaged in devotional service is not in the material condition of life, although he may appear so. This is very important. You think that we are in material bodies? and we're stuck here in the material world just like ordinary living entities? No, 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 because we're constantly in touch with the Lord through his holy name. See, this association of the holy name gives us actually the Lord's personal company. And this is so nice huh? that mukti, again, it becomes insignificant. insignificant. Why? Because a devotee who's engaged in devotional service is already liberated. Why should we desire mukti when we already have mukti? Mukti is nothing. It's just the beginning of engaging in devotional service. Because to engage in devotional service, you have to be on the spiritual platform. So if you're engaged in devotional service, you're automatically liberated. There's no need to strive separately for liberation. Huh? That's just for people whose spiritual vision is very uh, limited, who can only understand things in reference to this material existence. So they're thinking, well, the uh, origin of all troubles and sufferings is this material body. So if I can get liberated and get out of this material body somehow or other, then I won't have any more problem. But actually, uh, this kind of thinking is very self-centered, very selfish, very limited. Even if one was uh, liberated from the material body, then what? What are you going to do? Uh, we, we require some engagement. We would be bored if we were just floating around in space somewhere with nothing to do. Uh, how long is that going to last? So we find that the impersonalists, even if they get mukti, they again fall down and come back to the material world out of sheer boredom. So... <laughs> It's much better to be situated in the devotional service of the Lord, which is ever-increasing, ever-expanding happiness and bliss. And why, do we, why would we desire mukti if we have that? Now here's one of the nicest sections in the whole book here. Recitation of Srimad Bhagavatam among devotees. Srimad Bhagavatam is the desire tree of Vedic wisdom. Veda itself means the aggregate of knowledge. And whatever knowledge is required for human society is perfectly presented in Srimad Bhagavatam. There are different branches of knowledge in the Vedic writings, including sociology, politics, medicine, and military art. All these and other branches of knowledge are perfectly described in the Vedas. So as far as spiritual knowledge is concerned, that is also perfectly described there. And Srimad Bhagavatam is considered to be the ripened fruit of this desire-fulfilling tree of the Vedas. 
A tree is honored by the production of its fruit. For example, a mango tree is considered very valuable because it produces the king of all fruits, the mango. When the mango fruit becomes ripened, it is the greatest gift of that tree. And Srimad Bhagavatam is similarly held to be the ripened fruit of the Vedic tree. And as ripened fruit becomes more relishable when first touched by the beak of a parrot or shuka, Srimad Bhagavatam has become more relishable by being delivered through the transcendental mouth of Shukadev Goswami. The Srimad Bhagavatam should be received in disciplic succession without any breakage. Uh, let's stop there and go back. Um, I've said this many times, that Srimad Bhagavatam is so deep and so profound that it's full of all knowledge. Huh? All knowledge is there. In every word of Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a great science. Huh? Just like in Vishnu Sahasranam, it's on the same level. But the difference is Srimad Bhagavatam is 18,000 shlokas. And Vishnu Sahasranam is only, what, 130, 140 shlokas or something like that. So uh, 18,000 shlokas. And in every word of this Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a great science. Huh? People don't believe this, but I spent almost 10 years of my life researching these two words, Swara Sapta. Huh? Swara Sapta means seven notes, seven swaras that are used in chanting of Vedic mantras. And uh, these two words are so profound that you could spend your whole lifetime just researching their implications. I'm not exaggerating. You could probably spend several lifetimes just working out all the deep meanings of these words. So we should not think that this uh, Srimad Bhagavatam is an ordinary book or even an ordinary religious scripture. Srimad Bhagavatam is incredibly profound. And if you study it, not just read it like a novel or, or like any ordinary kind of book, but really study it, really try to go deep into its meaning, uh, you'll be amazed. You won't be able to get through the first chapter. You'll be like... <laughs> I mean, just the first shloka of Srimad Bhagavatam. Huh? Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Janmadhyasya Yaton Vayari Taritas Chateshka Vigyasvarat Dhamna Svena Sadhani Rastakuha Kam Satyam Parandhimahi. I mean, if you start you're looking into the meaning of this one shloka, you could spend a year. What was it? Um, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur one time for one solid month spoke on the first shloka of Srimad Bhagavatam. For one solid month, day and night. Uh, morning and evening classes. Each class was maybe one hour, two hours long. For one solid month, every day, morning and evening, he spoke on the first shloka of the 18,000 shlokas. <laughs> uh, I can understand how you could do that. Because the whole Vedanta, the whole meaning of Vedanta is there in just the first shloka. <laughs> then, it, then it goes on from there. So try to understand how great is this book. My God. Srimad Bhagavatam should be received in disciplic succession without any breakage. When a ripened fruit comes from the upper part of the tree onto the ground, by the process of being handed down from a higher branch to a lower branch by persons in the tree, the fruit does not break. Srimad Bhagavatam, when received in the parampara system or disciplic succession, will likewise remain unbroken. It is stated in Bhagavad Gita that the disciplic succession or parampara is the way of receiving transcendental knowledge. Such knowledge must come down through the disciplic succession, through authorized persons who know the real purpose of the Shastra. We were talking about this the other day, that in the preface to Srila Prabhupada's original 
Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a paragraph that goes something like, there is a pinprick in the human society and nobody knows what the cause of this disturbance is. But the cure is in Srimad Bhagavatam because Srimad Bhagavatam provides ontological education that is absolutely necessary for the peace of human society. Words to that effect. Uh, and then in the American edition, published in, uh, first published in about 1972, 1971, 1972, the word ontological education were left out. You see? So this is breaking the parampara. When you change the guru's words, you break the parampara.